What's up, everybody? Thanks, as always, for supporting the show. It would mean a lot to me if you would take a second to scroll down and hit that subscribe button to the Hoops Tonight YouTube channel, and then follow me on social media on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter so you guys don't miss any of our content over the course of this season. All right, let's talk some basketball. You always said you'd be skeptical of the Nuggets if they lost any of their starting five. So with KCP gone, do you see a path of their starting lineup being just as good next year with Christian Brown, although it would be different stylistically? Also, does Russ to Denver move you? So here's the thing. To put it very simply, the Nuggets are worse than they were last year. And last year, they weren't good enough. Now, I think they were better than they looked last year. I think KCP and Jamal Murray were both a little banged up by the time they even got into the Minnesota series. And that ended up being where one of their main areas of, of underperforming in that series. But despite all that, they were up 20 in the, in the second half of game seven. So like, I'm of the opinion that like, yeah, losing KCP makes them worse. Yeah. Them being banged up played a role last year. Yeah. They're a little bit vulnerable to specific matchups, but like, I still think gun to my head, if I had to pick one team to be that my favorite in the Western Conference next year, even with Christian Brown sliding into that starting two spot, I think I still lean Denver. I just I think Jokic is the best player in the world. I think they're going to come into next season angry and motivated. Their margin for error is smaller. If they win the title next year, it'll be much harder than when they won in 2023. But I think writing them off is foolish. And they have some time. They have some time to figure some things out. Like my guess is that in the long run, this ends with them trying to flip Michael Porter Jr. into two quality starters at some point in the future. But that Aaron Gordon, Jamal Murray, Nikola Jokic core is still one of the best three-man cores in the league, and I think it'd be foolish to write them off. Does Russ to Denver move you? I, I Here's the thing. I've gotten in a lot of trouble with Russell Westbrook fans. As a basketball fan, I loved watching Russell Westbrook when he was in his prime. But as he declined out of his prime, he became, in my opinion, one of the most unlikable players in the NBA. The amount of stupid stuff that he does and the mistakes that he makes. like All I'm going to say is, as somebody who covered him closely with the Lakers, and now the Clippers don't want him either, Like Denver, do not make this mistake. Like This is... It'd be really interesting, too, because LeBron made the same mistake. Jokic is about to make... Apparently, all the intel is Jokic is kind of pushing for that behind the scenes. Like... There's some elements that you like, right? Like he gives you an athletic guard to put on the floor. He's a guy that brings dribble penetration, which is something that, as we all know, Denver lacked last year. But just there's got to be a better option than than Russell Westbrook. Russell Westbrook, it's just, trust me, guys, for every good play he makes, he'll make at least one bad play. And in the aggregate, it is going to be something that has a negative impact on the win- on the team. How big are you on the Grizzlies going into next season? What moves do you think they need to look at in the offseason? Cheers from India. Thanks for supporting the show. Um, I'm really high on the Grizzlies. It's hard to say where they match up with the top teams in the league because it's just been so long since we've seen them all put together and playing that like I want to see a larger sample size before I start like ranking them. But here's the thing. Gigi Jackson and Zach Eady add a bunch of athleticism on the wing and size on the front line. They're going to have big looks. They're going to have small looks. John Morant played like just a few games last year and looked like one of the best players in the world. So like... I, I, I think they're going to be right there in the top of the conference next year in the top four seeds. We'll see what they amount to as a playoff team, but I'm a huge believer in Memphis, and I would be stunned if they didn't have a dominant regular season this year. And if they didn't, it would probably be related to health. I think Oklahoma City could have two to three championships in the next six years. They're a well-organized franchise, and they are, for me, the top three best team in the league right now behind Denver and the Celtics. Do you agree? I do. I I don't quite have them up on Denver's level yet, but I think they're clearly the second best team in the West. And right now, I'd take them over any Eastern Conference team not named Boston. I Originally, I thought it was Denver-Boston and then a a gap. I think a couple teams are going to enter into that tier this year, but Oklahoma City is definitely one of them. And and right now, before we see all this shake out, because I want to see who Philly ends up rounding out their roster with like I want to see if the Lakers end up making some sort of trade like there's a bunch of stuff that I want to see but for right now without having seen the rest of the move the player movement Oklahoma City to me is the third best team in the league hey Jason love the pod how big of a deal is Denver losing KCP with OKC OKC adding Hartenstein are they now the clear favorites in the west as I talked about earlier I still think I lean slightly towards Denver um, but that said, Oklahoma City adding Hartenstein gives them more resiliency against Denver. I would have given Oklahoma City a 0% chance to beat Denver in a playoff series last year. This year, I give them a substantial chance, even though I'd pick Denver. So that to me is a substan- uh, like a significant move in that direction. 
If Tatum were to become a good to great half-court shot creator, would he be in the conversation for best player in the world? That's really the difference. He does everything else so well. He just has to get a – like, I don't think playmaking is the weakness for him. It's his shot-making ability. He just has to become a guy who can be a 60% true shooting, 30-point-per-game guy consistently in the playoffs in order to uh, to justify being in that conversation. There's just been too much inconsistency on that end of the floor. Again, like to put it simply, like – is Tatum as good a half court surgeon as Shea Gilgis Alexander? No, not prop, not really close. Uh, is Shea Gilgis Alexander as good a half court shot creator as like the Luka Jokic tier? No, not really close. So like, I almost look at Tatum as like a third tier half court shot creator. And so like from that standpoint, like I still think he's got a ways to go to enter into those best player in the world conversations. What do you see the power rankings in the East being? And do you see the redistribution of talent has made it a strong enough conference that Boston would now be equally or less likely than Philly or the Knicks to make it to the finals? Still think Boston's a clear favorite. I think they're clearly number one. I think they're clearly better than the next group. Knicks, Sixers, Bucks. It all depends on what Milwaukee and Philly accomplish over the next couple of months. But for right now, it's all up in the air for me. I'd probably go Knicks two, Philly three, Milwaukee four. Um just because of some of the health questions surrounding Philly, but Boston's a clear number one, and we'll settle that out when we get into the end of the summer and we do our contender rankings. What do you think will be the next unexpected star to get traded because his team decides to throw in the towel to go into full rebuilding mode? The four guys I wrote down were James Harden, Brandon Ingram, Jimmy Butler, and Trey Young. Those are the guys that I think in the next 12 months could become available for trade. Harden's on a discounted deal now, uh, like an affordable deal, $35 million. It's a lot of money, but it's not an absurd amount of money, and it's only a two-year contract. And if Kawhi gets hurt again, I just think if you're the Clippers, you turn you trade Harden as part of a rebuild. Uh, Brandon Ingram is the odd man out, the weird fit in New Orleans, so I could see him getting moved. Jimmy Butler kind of feels like the end of the window. We're going to talk about him in just a minute. And then Trey Young, you know, like if Atlanta just decides that they want to move into a full rebuild, that's the guy that's obviously going to go. Thoughts on the Miami Heat consistently de de deciding to run it back year after year instead of improving? At what point do we need to call out Pat Riley? I've called out Pat Riley every summer for the same problem. And the main issue here is now it doesn't even make sense to go all in. Last summer was the last summer where it made any sense or last deadline was the last time it made any sense. They didn't get it done. Now, at this point, it feels like Jimmy's starting to kind of tail off a little bit. Bam, that doesn't, doesn't seem like there's much more of a ceiling there than what we've seen. So, like, at this point, it doesn't even make sense, and I think the window might be closed. And so, it is what it is. There was an opportunity to be aggressive there. Pat Riley never jumped on it, and I feel bad for Miami Heat fans. Jason, what do you make of the CBA? Are there any things you wish to see improved, and what do you make of the cap aprons? My only issue with it is, like, I think that those – restrictions need to be reconfigured to player movement rather than the draft. So for instance, like I don't think you should have to pay the price for drafting a bunch of good players and having to pay them all. But yeah, if you want to go out into the open market and trade for players or sign players in free agency, there should be punishments for just overspending, right? Just to try to level the playing field. But like, it's stupid to me that a team could just trade, uh, could just draft extremely well and end up uh, and end up uh, getting squeezed out of retaining talent. Now, there's caveats there. What about traded draft picks, right? Like Oklahoma City has a million first round draft picks, so of course they have a bunch of really good players, right? Well, there's an easy fix there. You just make it for your own draft picks. Like if you draft a pick with your original team's actual pick that belongs to you originally, then that player should not count towards those sorts of uh, sorts of cap exceptions. Essentially, like imagine it as like a spending budget outside of your own draft picks. That, that, that would be the way that I would look at it. But right now it just, it seems like it was really heavily geared towards the teams that were big spenders, but those teams weren't even the best teams in the league. Really. They just had giant payrolls. And like, I mean, the teams that had to get out of it, the Clippers and the Warriors, how much of a threat were they this season? They won two playoff games combined between the two of them. Right. So like, it's, it's one of those things where like, I think it was kind of like a reactionary thing to some large payrolls, but it doesn't really serve the purpose of creating fairness around the league. 